Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Malia Pavlo with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. In about a week following the webinar, we will be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. Please be patient as the post-webinar preparation of materials can take some time. Our pre presenters for today are Alice Brewer, Director of Clinical Affairs for TrueD Smart UVC, Angie Dixon, Manager of Quality and Infection Prevention at Providence St. Peter, and Rebecca Nicodemus, Infection Preventionist at Providence St. Peter Hospital. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Alice to begin today's presentation. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today as we talk about the real-world success with UVC disinfection that Providence St. Peter Hospital saw in a recent uh, pilot program that they implemented. As Aliyah mentioned, I do work for Trudy as the Director of Clinical Affairs. I am an epidemiologist by training and have previously worked as a, a system director of infection prevention for a large health system. So I'm now tackling infection prevention from a slightly different perspective. But I absolutely love talking to all these different hospitals and infection preventionists about um, their ATI reduction goals and, and plans for reduction. So today we are going to talk about how can UVC disinfection help lead to a safer healthcare environment? Like I mentioned, we'll talk through the details of the pilot program that Providence St. Peter Hospital conducted, and Angie and uh, Becca have some great slides to share with you, um, which will include also the results of that pilot program and how they're currently using Trudy at their facility. And then we'll also touch a little bit on the way that they are using reflective paint to help improve their cycle times and just increase the efficiency of the process. So I will let Angie and Becca introduce themselves in just a moment. I have a few slides to kind of touch on UVC and why it's important and kind of the reason we're having this webinar today. So with the increasing importance being placed on hospital-acquired infections, it's really more important than ever that hospitals are as clean as they can be. Approximately one in 25 admissions results in a hospital-acquired infection. And that increases costs and length of stay for the patient, but it also increases cost and penalties for the hospital. So it really becomes a significant uh, patient safety and financial burden. Um, Currently, the accumulated costs are approaching about $11 billion spent on, on hospital-acquired infections in this country. So there are many prominent researchers and professional associations that have recognized the need for utilizing this enhanced disinfection as a best practice. And there are a number of choices for enhanced or no-touch disinfection but UVC has really become the technology of choice for hospitals due to the balance of efficacy and ease of use. TrueD, the sponsor today and who I work for, was the first company to the UVC device market about 10 years ago and has a proven track record of successful outcomes. And there are a number of devices on the market to choose from, um, but TrueD being the first to the market um, really has the strongest track record of, um, of outcomes um, within the hospital setting. So these are just some of the about half dozen uh, independent third-party studies on UVC disinfection and Trudy specifically. Um, these have all demonstrated Trudy's ability to kill MDROs um, in, in a hospital setting. Um, and it also includes the only randomized controlled trial um, to study UVC efficacy and, and outcomes. I think research is really important and as you're thinking about using UV or selecting a device, uh, it's very important to take a look at 
the research that's out there and um, all of these studies on TRUD are completely independent. TRUD had no input in the financing or the analysis or the study design of these, which I always think is important to point out. Because when you're trying to decide if a device is right for you, um, that data that you're looking at needs to be completely independent from the device manufacturer. So I encourage you to take a look at some of these studies if you're interested in UV. Um, they're great sources of information. So one of those studies that I mentioned was the Better D or Better Disinfection Study. It's the only randomized controlled trial on UVC efficacy. Um, it was conducted uh, at nine hospitals in the Duke Infection Control Outreach Network and was funded by the CDC. Um, it lasted about two years and they saw a 30% reduction in the risk of transmission of Versa, MRSA, VRE, and C. diff when you add UV to standard cleaning protocols. Uh, they also saw a secondary outcome of significant reduction of hospital-wide incidence of C. diff and VRE when you treat isolation rooms or those high-risk rooms with UV. So what that means is that in the real world, by using UV on only your highest risk rooms, so those that we tag with um, contact precaution or contact and tear precaution, uh, you can really impact and affect the health and safety of every single patient in your hospital, regardless of what room they're being admitted to or who the previous occupant of that room was. So a secondary study that they conducted was around the implementation of UV disinfection. Um, and they found that by overcoming barriers to implementing UV, they were really able to achieve about a 90% utilization and maintain that throughout the study. And as you can imagine, the two biggest barriers that they faced were timely and accurate identification of uh, those isolation rooms that need UV, but also overcoming the time constraints to allow EVS time to run the UV. Um, we all know room turn time is a critical thing. And so overcoming that barrier becomes a major issue in hospitals. Um, there were four strategies that they used to overcome those barriers. Um, including good communication between EVS and IP and bed control and nursing. Um, setting patient safety as a priority to say, you know, we know that we have these parameters that we have to hit and we have patients that we need to get admitted, but we really need to set that um, room cleanliness and patient safety as the, our highest priority and make sure that we get that UV run. Um, they did a great job of tracking compliance to make sure that they knew where there were gaps and where they were missing rooms and why so that they could close those gaps. And then appropriate resource allocation. So that means both on the staffing side, but also on the equipment and the device side. So making sure that you have adequate staffing when you have your highest times of discharge, making sure that the devices are in areas of highest use so that they're accessible when they're needed for those discharges. So speaking of implementation, there are many other studies besides that Better D study on implementation. VCU and UNC Healthcare have done similar studies. Um, you know, the, the thing that Trudy has learned over the last 10 years of putting devices into the market is that a really well-planned implementation is the key to a successful disinfection program. And this is part of what Angie and Beck are gonna to speak to in a moment. Um, first and foremost, a multidisciplinary team is really critical to that successful implementation. And that includes um, infection prevention and environmental services, of course, they tend to take the lead with these, but it's also important to have nursing and bed control um, at the table, as well as hospital leadership. Creating such a team really helps ensure that everybody's on the same page and that success is kind of everybody's goal. Um, and Angie and Becca and their team at Providence did a great job of creating um, this multidisciplinary team. And I know they're gonna to speak to that in a moment. Um, 
Once you have that team in place, there are some key components to successful implementation, and those include training, um, communication, um, customized protocols, so specific to your hospital, but then also monitoring of outcomes once you have the implementation in place. Many hospitals like to use pilot programs or trial periods. These are great ways of testing out a new technology, and that's exactly what Providence did. Um, it's a great way to see how easy it is to get that implementation integrated into your existing processes, processes and ensure that you can move ahead smoothly with minimal interruption. And at TrueD, we take the approach of implementing a pilot program or a trial with the exact same attention to detail as a full implementation. So we wanna make sure that you're successful, even if it's just a short-term look at the technology to see if it fits with your hospital's process. So we call what we do the TrueD program, but it's really what should be best practice regardless of which UDB device or any other device that you use in your hospital. Um, it starts with customized protocols. So we'll sit down with you and work through what your current concerns and HAI reduction goals are, uh, as well as looking at what your current processes for infection prevention and environmental cleaning, um, just to see what you're currently doing and where we can fit UV in. That really allows us then to design a protocol for using TrueD that best meets your hospital's needs and characteristics um, and allows us to provide some recommendations for how you can be successful um, at reducing HAI. And sometimes that includes looking at some of your processes around TrueD, so the bed tracking and communication and um, just the way that TrueD and UV gets integrated into your system. The next step in the, the process is training. Um, we provide a lot of on-site training um, and we'll do it in a way that makes the most sense for your hospital and staff. Uh, sometimes that means we train all EDS staff. So in a smaller hospital, we might just train everybody. But in a larger hospital or a health system, it might make more sense to do a train the trainer approach or create some Trudy champions who can take the lead at making sure that any new employees or um, changes of shifts have the most up-to-date training. The other thing that we provide for you are competency checklists and certifications um, of training for all EVS employees so that should you have a regulatory agency come in and ask about the technology and, and your training practices, you have documentation that people have been trained. It's also a great um, encouragement tool for your EVS staff. Um, we you know, like to promote our EVS partners um, as equal, you know, warriors in the fight against hospital acquired infections because their role is critical. Um, so it's a great thing for them to have a certificate that says, you know, I've been, been trained to, to fight hospital acquired infections. So communication, as I mentioned before, is a key piece and we um, include that as our part of our implementation process. Um, we really want to have communication from the beginning with every stakeholder in the hospital. Uh, we conduct joint review calls with your multidisciplinary group or team. Um, and we can do that on a cadence that fits best for you guys. Oftentimes we start out with a weekly um, call and then settle into monthly or quarterly calls as the process gets going. And, um, becomes routine. Um, I know Angie and Becca have been having those calls. I've been on some of those calls um, and I think they're gonna speak to that um, in their presentation. Our marketing and communication team can also provide you with all kinds of materials um, to educate both patients and staff. So that might be table tent cards um, to put on the bedside table to let your patients know that their room has been disinfected with UV. Could be posters for um, the elevator or the units to let them know um, what steps are being taken to protect them. Um, we have many hospitals that have big banners um, in the lobby or, or public areas to um, let patients and families know um, that Trudy is being used in the hospital. And as we know, 
you know, healthcare is becoming a, a very consumer driven industry and many times patients have a choice of where they receive care. And so this is one way to let them know that you as a hospital are doing everything that you can to protect them. And I heard from many patients that they really appreciate that extra step um, and makes them feel much more comfortable. So the last step of this program and, and certainly one that um, is ongoing um, for as long as you are using the devices, that monitoring of outcomes, because implementing UV is important, but if you're not tracking and monitoring where and when it's being used, it's really hard to see the utility and value in the intervention. So I mentioned I'm an epidemiologist, which means I love data and collecting data. Um, and so collecting as much of it as possible and then using it to tell a story about what you are accomplishing becomes really important. So that might be um, taking your utilization and tracking it against your infection rates to you know, show that return on investment or that correlation between what you're doing and what the outcomes are. Um, it might be goal setting for your ORs and saying, well, we want to clean them on this schedule and, and yes, we're achieving that. So we have, these are just a couple of examples of the reports that we have available um, that we can send to help you kind of really see what you're doing and, and where you're using that device and making sure that you're using it in the areas where you would like to be using it. Um, our goal is really to provide you with as much data as possible, um, but without you having to do any extra work for it. So we have a lot of strategies um, to help provide you with what you need um, to really help achieve your infection reduction goals. And I'll end by saying that our goal really is to partner with you. Um, we don't want you to feel like you've just bought a device and then we've walked away. So this is really us um, forming a partnership and providing you with a service and not just a device. So right now I will turn it over to Angie and Becca to share with you their experience with Trudy. Awesome, thank you, Alice. I appreciate your time and introduction uh, to Trudy and um, all the exciting things and opportunities. Um, so this is Angie talking. I am the uh, manager for quality infection prevention, actually for Providence Southwest Washington Service Area, which includes um, two hospitals. And today we'll be focusing obviously on our story at Providence St. Peter Hospital. But um, in, as a result of our success, we will be translating this to our smaller hospital. And so uh, I have been in healthcare. I was just talking to Becca, I hate to say it, but 33 zero years. Hard to believe I'm an old night shift critical care nurse and I've spent the last 17 years in quality and infection prevention. And then Becca, who uh, is uh, one of our infection preventionists, um, has 12 years in healthcare experience, a uh, medical doctor, and um, also a quality background. So um, thank you. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so Providence St. Peter, just a little bit of story about them. As you can see, we are a nonprofit teaching facility with magnet recognition. As part of Providence St. Joseph Health, which is the third largest nonprofit organization across the, the nation. Um, our teaching uh, focus is really, uh, we have a huge family residency uh, program as well as pharmacy and nursing. One thing that I wanted to call out with those 390 beds that I think uh, puts this program in perspective as in relation to some of our challenges is the fact that our inpatient beds span 11 floors. And so we have a really large tower. And um, with that, we have 16 operating rooms. Three of those are C-section rooms. And with this project, we focused on the main OR, which was 13. Uh, 13 ORs, with one of those being added about a year and a half ago, um, and it's a hybrid OR, so it's massive. Uh, we do a lot of our cardiac procedures and tavers in that program. And as we expand on our surgical services, we do a little bit of everything from neuro to cardiac to robotics. And uh, we are on a high reliability organization journey to a zero harm focus, and, and so, our system goal actually uh, for CDEF 
and actually all of our hospital acquired infection metrics is by 2020 that we will be in the top 25th percentile nationwide, which is essentially zero to be able to do that. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. One thing that we've learned with our infection prevention program, it's, been, it's a well-oiled machine. Um, I've been here now uh, five years, but it was a long, standing strong infection prevention program long before I got here. But one thing that we've learned is with infection prevention, there's no smoking gun. It takes a lot of different um, um, different prongs, uh, a pronged approach to infection prevention. And um, tapping into technology is definitely one of those key prongs that we felt like we had to reach to get there and, and to get to zero. And uh, today we're going to focus obviously on C. diff. Uh, and surgical site infection, but both of those, uh, we have uh, multidisciplinary teams that over the years have focused on all of the basic, if you will, horizontal infection prevention strategies and implementing them and uh, really shoring up those things. I mean, I could probably rattle on an hour about that alone, but surgical site infection, uh, we've uh, focused on, um, you know, skin prep and bathing protocols and nose to toes in the pre-op setting, or that's the uh, uh, betadine nasal uh, ointment and oral care and PHG bathing in pre-op before they even get into the OR. And over the last couple of years, we've really focused on the, you know, the CDC suggested enhanced uh, room cleaning for patients with multi-drug resistant organisms and of course damp dusting and in between case cleaning and of course all of the work around antibiotics and antimicrobial stewardship and that kind of ties nicely into our C. diff efforts where you know we've literally thrown about everything including the baby with the bath water at C. diff over the last few years and uh, including things like quarterly bleach sweeps where we don't wait until we have a cluster to do to use bleach uh, but we use a you know at a minimum per quarter and we've changed our basic um, environmental cleaning disinfectant to what's called birex plus which is it actually has uh, a higher antimicrobial um, you know, kill time associated with it with a lower contact time because one of the things we found is is people weren't reaching the contact time and that included the OR as well as patient room cleaning and turnovers with our previous product. And so with the Virex Plus, again, that technology really helping them reach, uh, reach those um, contact times and being a more um, compliant with that. And then the other thing that we did over the last few years is we engaged on a huge curtain project. Something so basic as curtains, uh, we found that we weren't changing them on isolation discharges. And so we started asking that repetitive question of why? Why aren't we doing that? That's like a min spec. And so some of the things that we uncovered was um, it was virtually almost impossible for our environmental services workers to change the curtains, the length of time that it would take, our throughput pressure, and all of that. So uh, we engaged on a, um, a pilot project. That's kind of a buzzword for our service area. If we want to do anything, we always say we want to do a pilot, and we generally always get our wish. And so we did a pilot project with curtains where we literally got rid of, we transitioned to curtains that the uh, environmental services workers could easily get up and get down literally within seconds. And so it's called on the right track. And that allowed us, once we piloted that and received success and saw that it wasn't going to impact our throughput time, we spread that through both ministries. And now we change our cur curtains on a routine basis. And so just little things like that, that we felt like we really needed to shore up before we could um, add anything further. And we really got to that point in time and to where we had to do that with our C. diff rate and our surgical site infections, just because we, uh, we weren't where we wanted to be and we were actually seeing some increases despite all of our efforts. And so we started diving down into the UV technology and, uh, you know, 
definitely some recommendations uh, from CDC that you want to add that in if you're not getting to where you want to be. And so um, I actually have to put the, the idea in the hands of our director of, of, of hospitality who oversees our environmental services of, as well as a multitude of other things. But he actually approached me in the hallway one day and said, Angie, what do you think about um, UV technologies? And he brought up Trudy. And I'm like, I. Yes, that's exactly where we've been thinking. I, if you're willing, I am totally game and willing to give you my all to, to make this work. And so um, our team, our infection prevention team, our environmental services team, um, because we've been around the block a while, we've all had different experiences around UV technology. And so we shared our experiences from our past lives, from using different methodologies and types to uh, research that we'd already done. And we all kind of landed on that we felt like we wanted our pilot to be with Trudy. And um, so, of course, you know, we engaged in the Trudy folks and pulled them into our multidisciplinary team to really start the discussion on what that would look like. Next slide, please. So our evaluation um, for, I kind of got my, I had a little bit of myself here, but essentially the things that this, our team, our multidisciplinary team looked at when it came to really trying to figure out which UV disinfection we wanted to move towards, these were kind of our key elements that we felt like we needed. The top one was convenience ease of use, wouldn't add a lot of time to our throughput, and would be super easy for folks to integrate into their workflow. And of course, balanced with that, I call that the art of infection prevention, but we always want to balance art with infection prevention to the science behind infection prevention, which is what Trudy gave us. We felt like very confidently that science piece uh, with the randomized clinical trial and whatnot with the CDC that we felt like, all right, this gave us what we wanted uh, from a holistic perspective for, uh, the, for UV disinfection. Next slide, please. So our pilot project, um, we, uh, so this, uh, our work group really consisted of environmental services, infection prevention, transport, nursing leadership. I would even say medical uh, leadership because we had providers on that team, our infectious disease medical director. Of course, the operating room leadership were, were key partners, and I can't stress enough bed placement. I know everybody kind of does things a little bit differently around bed placement. We actually have a team dedicated to that, and so we had their manager and director as part of that team. And we really sat down and, and kind of started with a uh, uh, the IP team ferreted out a couple of ideas, if you will, around what a pilot could look like. And we took those ideas to the team and we really flushed that out and um, came up with our own idea, if you will, on how we wanted that six month pilot to work. And we wrote that pilot up in an SBAR format, so situation, background, assessment, and recommendation. It had a little bit of art to infection prevention in it. It also had a, the science and the references and resources on why this was important from that science perspective. And um, our the director of environmental services and I took that to our executive team for endorsement and approval. And we really felt like six months was key because um, we didn't feel like we could really see, you know, it, it took us a little while, even I'm getting into the implementation a little bit, um, but um, to really feel like we would see results in our data that would prove um, success, that we really needed at least six months. And realistically, as, you, as Becca will share, our data, um, especially for CDF, were more like a year out and first because of some challenges there. Uh, but that's, that's the main reason why we picked six months is that we wanted to, have, to, to really get the devices on site, get them into our workflow, and knew that there would be some challenges with that um, as far as learning how to use it and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. 
So we started with uh, the rental of two robots, and um, we, we really had no idea really where to start with 20, with two, um, and so we just thought, well, let's, let's start with two and see what we could do. And our initial intent was to start with all, um, all isolation discharges and, and every operating room every night. But we learned really quickly through our first weeks, uh, we, uh, the, our team for implementation, we were meeting weekly to kind of sort through this. And, um, you know, our foundation was really around a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt approach. Uh, we used the PDCA Plan, Do, Check, Act model for continuous improvement with these weekly team meetings. And we learned real quickly that um, our initial goal was a little bit of a BHAG. It was a big, hairy, audacious goal. And so we had to fine tune it a little bit. And so ultimately what we ended up landing on was is we would do all contact enteric discharge rooms throughout the tower. We narrowed it down to four high risk units and we defined our high risk units by a unit that had a CDF rate that was 12 or greater. And um, there's, you know, not a lot of science behind that 12 or greater but it was one that we came up with after discussion at the system level that that would be our min spec if you will for actionable CDF rates and so we had four units that met that criteria so we included those units and our goal was to get as many discharges on those units as possible and then ultimately the main OR suites those 13 OR suites we would hit them three times at least three times a week if not more and so it took us quite a few iterations, at least six iterations, to make that happen. Next slide, please. So, uh, of course, we didn't change anything with our environmental services team. They still did what they always did at their best. Um, a very strong team that um, continued their traditional approach to terminal cleaning, to enhanced cleaning, as, and then, of course, our staff our OR staff for that in-between case cleaning. So we always use bleach uh, for contact enteric discharges, and so we continue that as well. And also through the course of this pilot, we had a couple of um, quarterly bleach sweeps. And in that quarterly bleach sweep, the environmental services team, that's all they use until they get every single room, uh, they use bleach. And then, um, and then I already mentioned how we use, how we ended up uh, using Trudy and our high risk units are there. There are critical care unit, progressive care unit, our med renal floor, and our oncology floor. Next slide, please. So we started our pilot program uh, at October of last year, and I think I've already mentioned we met weekly through the course of those six months. And this date, um, so about the three month mark, our executive team came to us asking for an update. And so our director of environmental services and I put together not only uh, an update, but we also provided what we felt like the future state would look like, including a funding plan, because we weren't gonna take no for an answer with implementing Trudy throughout uh, our service area because we were starting to see success. And so they challenged us with, well, we don't have capital, blah, 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 but how about you guys write a grant to our foundation because we're in the, and we're in the open period for that. And so we did, and uh, we were successful. We asked for six devices as we, as we were learning, especially with our big tower, how many devices that we needed. And without offsetting or adding a bunch of FTEs for environmental services, we felt like we needed a six devices for uh, Providence St. Peter. So that's what we asked for. And uh, ultimately, we received funding for four devices, and uh, we continue to rent the other two devices as we, uh, with the last six months, as have really been trying to understand, do we need six devices? Can we do it with less devices? Can we do it with more devices? And I think right now we're still feeling like we need six devices. Um, and um, we did not have a gap. Um, so you can see if we started our pilot in October, then our pilot should um, end before June. But we had commitment uh, from our executive team and the 
port of Trudy as well to continue with our two devices until we got the other four devices on site. So we never had a gap in our pilot project to our future state. Next slide, please. And so we continue to provide regular updates to our executive team. And once we kind of um, got the new devices on site, we started meeting every other week in person, but then in between we would do a written report. So the team was still getting weekly updates, whether it was in person or it was um, via email. And then of course we leveraged our daily safety huddle to bring forward any issues that may have come about with safe throughput or denials of a contact enteric room or that type of thing. Because we made it very clear from the get-go that contact enteric rooms were a min spec required. Uh, we don't deny for those rooms. And so that was another way that we would leverage um, communicating and executing our, our plans around our pilot and then of course our future state. Next slide, please. And so I think I already mentioned our funding plan um, and uh, then of course our foundation board did approve those and we're currently, um, we, uh, Becca and I got to attend our smaller hospitals foundation fundraiser to gain support for, for, for our smaller hospitals to, to get two devices. So we're waiting to hear how much we raised uh, by that. But it's just kind of a unique, different way to go about funding, especially with capital being tight for many organizations, and then leveraging the rental opportunity um, because that doesn't, uh, that doesn't fold into the capital. So that's kind of how we were able to work around the capital issues, as well as having our executive support and leadership. Uh, they were our cheerleaders, if you will, throughout the course of this project, and we could not have done it without them. And uh, next slide, please. So we continue to go ahead and meet uh, twice a month, and we're still evaluating the device devices and um, collaborating with the team on how to use them. And I'll let Becca talk a little bit more about that. And we continue to have and receive from Trudy. So again, our Trudy partners became part of our multidisciplinary team with those weekly calls and providing us with the data on a weekly basis. I don't think we could have done this without that support because um, that really, um, really helped us see what we were doing. And because I'm such a visual person, um, Trudy developed uh, what we called heat maps. So like for our operating room, we had one page every operating room, Monday through, through whatever the end of the week is, Sunday. And uh, you could very clearly see that we would hit goal every single week in our operating rooms of at least three times or more in each operating room. And um, once we set that goal, we have 100% met that goal in the operating room. And we have similar success for our contact enteric uh, and our isolation discharges. But those heat maps were really super helpful, as well as a line list of, um, of all of the usage. And then from there, a time studies of each of, of by unit of how long it took the cycles to run and an average time and that sort of thing. And so um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Becca to just kind of uh, dive into that a little bit more. And Alice, next slide, thank you. Hi everyone, this is um, Becca and I'm gonna talk about um, how we're using Trudy today. So right now we're doing all isolation discharges on all floors and our next priority is as many high risk units as possible. We have six devices and we're in the process of staging on each device on every other floor during the day and the evening and at night we, our goal is to disinfect um, each OR room at least three times a week. Next slide please. So uh, this slide just shows the SSI rate uh, reduction. So pre-pilot to date, we have a 77% reduction. Um, this is inclusive of all other efforts we've taken. And um, we're, we're still seeing a decline in our SSIs. And the second, the next slide. So um, our CDF rates, 
pre-pilot to post-pilot, we saw a decline um, of 36%, and um, it was due to other variables in our data. We had other issues um, during the pilot, but now, um, over time, we are seeing a decrease in our rate. Um, if you look at February 2018, there's a spike. We did a deeper dive, and we found that it was due to inappropriate testing. We do still see that, um, and we are working on educating our staff on that. But overall, over time, there is a decline in our CDF rate. And the next slide. So we had more than 30 days without a hospital onset CDF, and our board was very happy about that, and we celebrated that um, with our staff. This gave us an opportunity to educate them on CDF as well as Trudy. So that was our celebration. Next slide. So the reflective pain trial started off, uh, we were using one Trudy in the operating room and we saw that it took about 15 minutes. So then we started using two Trudy devices. So that br brought down the cycle times to 20 to 25 minutes. And then we decided to try the reflective paint. So we painted two OR rooms um, and our cycle times came down from 25 minutes to 10 minutes. And we are currently trying to paint our patient rooms. We're trying to do a pilot again, trying to trial it out in two patient rooms to see if it can bring down the cycle time and help with the um, room turnover. Next slide. So at St. Pete's, we took um, a collaborative approach. We established a team. Without our team, we wouldn't have accomplished what we have. We started off with weekly meetings, then we went to bi-weekly meetings, and now we meet monthly. We discuss our utilization data, infection rate data, and we try to um, problem solve. For instance, we had an issue with bed placement and room turnover, and that's how we came up with the idea to stage our devices um, on every other floor. And as we meet, you know, whatever we're trying to fix, uh, we work on it together as a team. So that's what we've been doing. And if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box. And I'm going to let Alice take over. Uh, oh, this is Angie. I do want to just um, kind of make a plea for one other comment around our CDF rates. And that I think one of the key elements here uh, for our pilot not you know, we didn't like see a dramatic reduction in CDF right away, right? So the our pilot phase, we kind of stayed a little flat. Maybe if you added a trend line, you'd see a little decrease. But what we've noticed since having the additional four devices, six devices, that you can see the blue bars, how the utilization almost doubled as a result of that. And with that, we have continued to see uh, that decline, that 37% decline uh, with, with those additional devices. So our hypothesis is such that we didn't have enough devices um, during our pilot phase to see that, that greater than 30% reduction that is in the, the better study. But, um, but as we've added devices and we've really utilized the devices more and decreased that fecal pantina in the environment, we've, we are now seeing that significant reduction as a result, in addition to the other activities that have been going on. So just wanted to also call that out. Thanks, Angie and Becca, so much. I love um, hearing from hospitals how they've been successful and. Um, St. Peter has certainly been a great um, partner with us um, in their, their efforts to reduce their infections. And I just wanted to mention one more thing um, before we open it up to questions. And, and Angie mentioned this, that, you know, as she said, there's no smoking gun, there's no silver bullet. UVC is just one piece of um, a bundled approach. Um, so it really works best when you're implementing it alongside lots of other strategies. Um, whether those are infection prevention strategies like hand hygiene, antimicrobial stewardship, testing stewardship, good cleaning practices, those are all very important and need to be the best that they can be for UVC to really work its best. But there are also facilities and operation strategies like integrating it into your 
EHR or bed tracking system to really improve that efficiency. And then Becca touched on the reflective paint that can be used, which by the way, looks just like regular paint. When you put it on the wall, you wouldn't know that it's reflective paint, but there are a number of um, publications out there that have looked at that um, efficiency improvement in time. Um, Dr. Bill Rutala had one where he saw, I think it went from um, a four log reduction, they saw, you know, they brought it down um, to from 43 minutes to nine minutes. So um, really a great thing if you're concerned about room turn time. Um, it makes a huge difference in both ORs and patient rooms. So um, I think we can open it up to questions, Aaliyah. Great, thank you, Alice, Angie, and Rebecca for that excellent presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. Now, Angie, I'm going to direct this first question to you. One audience member wanted to clarify something. He said he wanted to clarify because bleach sweeps were, he wanted to clarify if bleach sweeps were continued by EVS during implementation and was hoping you could yeah. explain that process a little bit more. Oh, ab absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, so environmental services uses uh, the, well, I don't know if I can say products, but I am. Um, Clorox uh, bleach wipes, and so what they do is they change out their other disinfectant and then bring in the, the bleach wipes to do all of their cleaning, and then, and it's done each quarter and then until they hit every single room. So sometimes a bleach sweep can take a week, um, sometimes maybe a little bit longer until they hit every single room throughout the tower. And yes, that was definitely continued through the course of our pilot because for us, that's a min spec of our environment, our comprehensive environmental services program. Great, thank you for explaining that process a little bit more. The next question I'm also gonna direct to you. One of our audience members wanted to know if there was a control group to help kind of isolate the true impact of this device. No, uh, we just did a before and after study, if you will, uh, but not much changed through the course of that study. Uh, as far as what we, our min spec infection prevention program, we didn't make a lot of changes. We didn't change our testing protocol. We didn't change anything else. Um, we obviously focused on hand hygiene and appropriate donning and doffing of PPE, but that again is kind of our normal routine. And the other thing that we had going that we didn't spend a lot of talk about this year because C. diff was such a priority for us, we were, um, as part of our mandatory skills lab for nursing this year, uh, we've been uh, talking about the Bristol stool scale and how to properly document and when to send tests. Uh, and we have a system defined recommend or system definitions around that, um, you know, uh, two, two or more Bristol stool scales to six or seven over a 24 hour period. And so, Anyhow, we, we were, we've been educating around that, and then we've also been um, doing a lot of physician and provider education around testing, uh, but we certainly haven't changed our testing methodology. We use a, a PCR methodology, and so, um, of course, we know how sensitive and specific that test, particular test is and may pick up uh, some colonization in our data, but um, overall, um, we, we didn't have any changes to that. We are looking forward to that though. We will be adding the EIA test to our NAT uh, after the first of the year, uh, but not during this particular work. Great, thank you Angie for answering that. Um, the next question I'm gonna direct towards Alice. Um, this audience member wants to know if people need to leave the room when Trudy is activated solely to protect their eyes from UVC? Yes, and that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Uh, UVC is harmful to skin cells and eyes in particular. So you cannot be in the room while the device is operating. Um, our devices in particular are operated remotely by an, via an iPad. So you put the device in the room and, 
in the appropriate position and then leave the room. We have a, um, a motion sensor um, that comes with the device so that if the door were to open, it automatically turns itself off. Um, there's also a number of safety barriers that we can put place in front of um, the door to the room so that everybody knows not to enter. But um, it can be controlled completely remotely. Um, so there's no need to be in the room. And in fact, you cannot be in the room while the device is operating. Great, thank you so much for pointing that out and answering that question. The next question is, is the reflective paint trial being funded by Trudy? Um, this is Becca. No, it's not being funded by Trudy. We're still trialing the paint and um, it is not funded by Trudy. Great, thank you for answering that. The next question um, our audience member wants to know if Providence Health Laboratories use PCR testing for C. diff, Rebecca or Angie, do you want to answer that? Sure, I can an answer that. And my service area, uh, we do use PCR testing methodology. Um, I can't quite remember the percentage off the top of my head, but I want to say about half of Providence still does, and the other half have transitioned to uh, an algorithmic-based approach, so typically um, PCR followed by EIA. And we are looking forward to moving towards that after the first of the year. Great, thank you for answering that, Alice. Uh, I have another clarifying question from one of our audience members. He would like to know, for the four high risk area rooms, are you trying to hit as many regular discharges you can, or is it just focused on known isolation discharges? Um, so for the high risk units, we're trying to hit as many um, units as possible because our priority one is already isolation discharges, all isolation discharges, so high risk units is as many rooms as possible. Yeah, we figure there's some, sometimes can be a downtime or you're not discharging as many isolation patients in a day compared to other days. And we really wanted to uh, use the device as much as possible. And um, knowing that we probably had a fair amount of uh, fecal pantina in the environment, that hitting as many rooms as possible would only help us uh, be even more successful in reducing that bio load. Thank you for answering that. The next question I'm gonna to direct towards Rebecca or Angie. An audience member wants to know, at what point in the pilot did you know TrueD was making a difference? And when you knew, how did you know? I would say for surgical site infection, it was a little bit tricky in the sense that, you know, the surveillance period can be, uh, you know, up to 90 days. But definitely by mid-pilot, um, for both, we were feeling pretty confident um, because we had saw such a dramatic decrease in those first couple of months uh, for both uh, for those first three months for both surgical site and C. diff. And C. diff got a little noisy for us uh, when we had that spike in February that Becca had mentioned, and then on the on the deep dive of those cases, really realized we were doing some over testing for most of those cases. So if you were to take out the over-testing in that month, we only had like one or two um, in February that were true hospital onset cases, which again reflected that ongoing decrease. Great, thank you. So as a kind of uh, the next question, the pilot has shown success. So another audience member kind of wants to know about the cost savings involved. He asks, have you all, have you at all done a cost savings analysis on what you have seen um, by the reductions in infections? Yeah, this is Angie and with our, um, with our, during the pilot, at the six months of the pilot and, or wait, pre-pilot data six months um, towards our six months post-pilot for surgical site infection, we have about 353,000 in savings and uh, we used uh, Zimlikan's model for um, our cost analysis. 
And then for CDIP, we are about 214,000 in savings there using the same Simlicon model. Great, that's super interesting, thank you. Uh, the next person wants to know what you are doing to address hand hygiene at your facilities, kind of with the idea that patients can also contribute, contribute to contaminating the environment. Oh, absolutely, thank you for calling that out. We have a five-year hand hygiene program plan that we uh, implemented towards the end of 2017. And uh, so we have a very robust um, data plan when it comes to hand hygiene observations and helping us better understand hand hygiene. Um, that, um, so, and then from there, we have a lot of campaigning efforts and um, focusing on, uh, of course, the healthcare worker. But um, this year, towards the second half of 2018, we've been focusing on uh, implementing a little bit more focused efforts We've all, uh, in, re in and around patient hand hygiene. So being a little bit more um, specific and intentional about that. So each patient, uh, what we're implementing right now is that each patient get a little spiel on hand hygiene along with a little bottle of Purell and then um, and then also we're discussing incorporate trying a pilot project with our uh, environmental services worker and actually facilitating hand hygiene with the patient when they provide meals to the patients and that type of thing. Uh, of course, that's the patients who are walking, talking, and we have the other patients um, who aren't. And so we've been focusing on the last couple of years uh, things like chlorhexidine daily bathing uh, for patients with central lines and that type of thing. So definitely a lot of patient activities going on. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. We are going to try to sneak in a few more questions. The next audience member wants to know how much additional time does True D add to room t turnover time on average? Rebecca or Angie, I'll turn that to you if you guys want to answer that. Um, that's around 20 to 20, 25 to 20 minutes, I would say. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, did you evaluate other UVC systems and why did you decide to proceed with TrueD? So, great question. Um, we did, we, we did. So, about three years ago, we looked at a device in-house and um, at, at different competitors um, and then internally we didn't with this particular pilot because we really learned from other team members experiences around other devices and then we also um, we there's uh, other hospitals in the community just north of us that uh, we learned from their experience around Trudy as well and so we opted just to the pilot with Trudy primarily because of the fact that it was so easy to use, it was convenient, you just roll it in, you turn it on, you don't have to uh, reposition a bunch of equipment in the room or that type of thing. There's just a few basic setups that you do with like tinting the mattress, but you didn't have to do, you didn't have to like go in the room and put Trudy in there and then go back and flip everything and put Trudy in there. Just because of the way that Trudy doses the UV into the room as well as the reflection and whatnot. Um, that was kind of the other key thing is, is that the measured dosing that Trudy provides in the room. And so we ran every cycle on a spore cycle. And so Trudy has two different cycles, the spore cycle and then the bacterial cycle. And because we were aiming obviously after C. diff and spores, we just ran it on the highest cycle possible and we didn't alter that through the course of the pilot or our future state. We didn't want our team to have to dis distinguish which cycle do we run it on. We just wanted spore cycle every single time. And so um, having that ability to be able to do that um, it was the other thing that attracted us to Trudy. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm going to sneak in one more quick question, which is how often do you need to change the UVC bulbs? 
Hi, this is Alice. I can take that. Um, our bulbs are rated for about 9,000 hours. So normal use, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of about three years. Um, but as a part of the service that you that you buy when you buy Trudy, we will um, happily replace those bulbs for you. And we have field service technicians that are um, available really almost at a moment's notice to come and, and address any issues or concerns that you guys have um, with the device as far as bulb changing or, or anything else. Great. Thank you, Alice. That was the last question we had time for. This concludes today's program. I wanted to thank Alice Brewer, Angie Dixon, and Rebecca Nicodemus for sharing today and our audience for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.